Good morning, church. So this, this weekend, Mike and several of our elders are away on a special weekend. They've done this. They do this once a year and talk about where Fairmont Park is and talk about where we've been and talk about the future. So it's a very good weekend. Glad that those guys get to do that. So I am filling in for him this morning. Uh, also, if you didn't hear the announcement from Mike Brumley earlier, or if you haven't seen it in the bulletin, just one more reminder, next week we're going to one service for the summer, 9 o'clock Bible class, 10 o'clock service. We'll do that till August 11th, and then August 18th we'll go back to uh, our two services. My guess is that this summer there's going to be some times where we're going to be packed in here. We're going to think, man, we should have been two services. I'm pretty sure there's going to be some Sundays where it's going to feel like the whole town left, and we're really glad that we combined for the service. So starting next week, 9 o'clock Bible class, 10 o'clock worship service. Our passage today will come from Matthew chapter 20. We're going to be talking about the parable of the workers in the vineyard, Matthew chapter 20. As you're turning there, I have a question for you. Is God good to you? Is God always enough? So, for those of us who've been Christians for a while, we know what the answers should be, right? We, we know the knowledge that God is good, and we know we should trust Him, and sometimes that knowledge hits things in life, things happen, and we wonder, okay, wait a minute, this just got shook a little bit because something happened that didn't meet my expectations. Today, Jesus is going to challenge the disciples, and today, it's still the challenge today about our view of God and the life that we've been given. All right, so we're going to be in chapter 20, but I want to back up and give a little context here. In chapter 19, in verse 27, Peter's going to ask a question of Jesus. Then Peter said to him, meaning Jesus, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will they be for us? What then will there be for us? So you got to like Peter. I mean, Peter's that guy that asks the question that everybody else is thinking but's afraid to ask. And Peter's saying, hey, uh, we've sacrificed. Life's not been easy <coughs> with you, Jesus. You know, we've left our, our jobs we don't see our families as much. That brings on some tension. And if you haven't noticed, uh, the crowds hadn't been as friendly as when we first started this gig. Now they're about a week from Jesus' crucifixion. The crowds have got a little hostile. They never know exactly where they're going to sleep or where their next meal is. And Peter just looks and says, Jesus, we've done, we've sacrificed for you. What's in it? for us. Now, Jesus doesn't condemn him for asking the question. In fact, he gives a great answer. Look in verse 28, chapter 19. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or, farm, or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. So Jesus is saying, Peter, I get it. You guys have sacrificed, and I want you to know your reward will be a hundredfold, a hundred times your sacrifice. And he says, and you will inherit internal life. Man, great answer, great assurance, except Jesus didn't stop there. And then he says in verse 30, 
but many who are first will be last and the last first. Now, by this time, the, the disciples have been with him for almost three years. And when Jesus says something and then he throws out some little line like that, you know they're going, oh, man, here it comes. We're fixing to get hit with something we don't understand. It's going gonna, it's gonna to challenge our views. Jesus is fixing to tell us something here. Now, verse 20. Jesus begins the parable. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. So Jesus starts a story here, and the character, the main character, is a landowner who's about to plant his vineyard. And evidently, there's a marketplace where men go uh, and Others know that they can go and hire them. Men go to find work. And so in this story, he goes, and it says early in the morning. Now, when we read further, we're going to find out that he's talking about this early. He goes out at 6 a.m., all right? The Jewish work day, especially the labor, was like 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening. And they really liked to get started early because it was cool, and sometimes the heat uh, particularly in the summers, could be really bad. So 6 a.m. was a good starting time. So he goes out and he finds these men, and he agrees to, they agree to work for a full day for a denarius. Now, a denarius was a silver coin. It was the standard going rate for a full day's work of labor. Not only that, that was the rate that most Roman soldiers got for a day of military service was a denarius. So it was a fair wage. Uh, it was a very common wage given for a full day's work. All right, let's continue on. Verse 3, and he, meaning the landowner, went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. And again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour, and he did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? And they said to him, Because no one hired us. And he said to them, You go into the vineyard too. All right, so here's the setting. So first time, 6 a.m., he goes in, he finds some men he hires them to go help plant his vineyard. He comes back into the marketplace about 9 a.m. He finds some others, and, and this time they don't make an agreement on a pay. He says, he says, I will pay you, I will give you whatever is right. So they agree to that. And then he comes back at noon, and he hires some more to work. And then he comes back at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and he hires some more. And then he even goes back at 5 p.m., the work day's almost over, <clears throat> and he finds some more guys who are there idle, and he hires them for the last hour of the day. So you've got these groups of people. You've got these men, by the end of the day, they're hot, they're sweaty, and they're tired because they put in 12 hours a day. You have another group of men who've worked nine hours. That's a pretty good day. Another group who's worked six hours. Another group, only three hours, but then you've got this one group that worked one hour. I mean, they've even barely broke a sweat for the day. They put in one hour. All right, here's where the story twists. Verse 8, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. And when those hired first came, they thought they should receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. Yeah, they were not happy, <laughs> not happy at all. 
So you can imagine this scene. The, the landowner tells the foreman, hey, line everybody up. We're going to pay them. Start with those who came last, all right, the ones who worked one hour. And he pays them a denarius for one hour of work. That's a full day's wages. But he paid them that. Now, I'm guessing the others in the line for a brief moment were pretty excited. I'm sure they were going, hey, if those guys got a denarius, what do we get? Well, as they went through and it came back to the people in the first who'd been there for 12 hours, they got a denarius too. And a riot started. They were not happy at all. And if you look at their words, they had, a, they had a statement to make. And you can help me finish this statement. What they were saying is, that's not fair. That's not fair. Okay? All right. So how did the landowner respond? Verse 13. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the landowner brings out this point, and I want to submit to you something about the guys who worked all day long. They were very happy with their deal in the beginning, right? Now, if they'd been the only ones and they'd got paid that, they had gone and left and been very happy, content, and satisfied. But the minute that they started comparing their situation to somebody else's situation, and when they tallied the score, they got the short end of the stick, then they were unhappy. Then they were angry. And then they felt like they had been cheated and been wronged. I want to submit to you today that this principle that we find in here is something that we struggle with today. That when we look around and when we compare, when we start keeping score and we feel like we're on the short end of the deal, we become quite angry. (laughs) We begin to complain about fairness. We lose our joy. So I don't know about for you, but sadly, I fell into this unfairness Uh, mindset very early in life. Now, when I was 10 and I was entering the fifth grade, uh, back in that time, everybody got wore crew cuts, I think they were called, or burrs. You just cut off all your hair. Nearly all the guys had that. But when I came into fifth grade and I was 10 years old, there were a couple of guys that had let their hair grow out during the summer. And I liked the looks of it. And I started looking at that, and I noticed some older guys that had begun to let their hair grow out. And I thought, I'd like to grow my hair out. So I went and talked to my mom, and she said, you know you need to talk to Dad. Oh, brother, that's not what I wanted to do. But Mom set it up, and I talked to Dad, and I said, Dad, some guys have grown their hair out, and I like it, and I'd like to grow my hair out too. Well, Mom, I'm sure, had already prompted him because without missing a beat, Dad started talking about hippies, long hair, disrespect, troublemakers. And in the end, he said, you're too young. Shut that down. So months went on. I had not forgotten it. I still looked at the few guys who had long hair. I still wished I had long hair, but Dad said no. I didn't like it. So Christmas break came, and when we came back, a couple of more guys' hair had grown out, including Steve. Now, this was a big thing for me. Steve was on my eight-year-old baseball team, and his dad and my dad coached together. My dad liked his dad, and he really liked Steve. 
Steve was like the biggest yes sir, no sir guy there was. My dad had a lot of respect. Steve grew his hair out. I knew that was something I could hold on to. So I talked to mom and I said, mom, I really would like to grow out my hair and I'd like to talk to dad about it again. So she set it up. We had another talk. And I told him, Steve's hair, he's grown his hair out. And dad, I'm, I'm not a troublemaker and I'm not going to be a troublemaker. That's not who I am. And my dad was like, Ugh, I'll think about it. Well, think about it turned into two weeks. And finally, I went to dad and said, so dad, can I grow my hair out? And he said, okay, I got to grow my hair out. So it was kind of fun. My sisters liked it, younger sisters. My mom kind of liked it. My brother liked it. I was kind of getting attention as it began to grow out. And after about a month as it was growing out, I had not been a troublemaker. After a month, one night at the supper table, my little brother, who's seven, says, Hey, Dad, can I grow my hair out? And Dad said, Ah, I guess so. And I didn't say anything, but inside I was going, whoa, 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 wait a minute. It took me four months to get to this point. I had to muster up the courage. I had to stand up to Dad. I had to say things while my heart was about to beat out of my chest. I had to wait this long, and I'm 10 and he's 7. That's not fair. Next year came 6th grade and 11th. This other thing came out, bell bottoms for guys. <laughs> Same thing went through. Dad, I want to wear bell bottoms. You're crazy. No, son of mine's going to wear bell bottoms. Try it again four months later. Oh, okay. I get bell bottoms. It's all the talk of the family. My little brother a month later says, Hey, Dad, can I get some bell bottoms? Yes, you can get bell bottoms. That felt like my life as a, not only a young kid but as a teenager as I focused on how unfair it was. And I kept score. Now, I won't do it, but I'm sure I could make a long list to this day of all the things that I had to wait till this old. But brothers, sisters, they got to do it a lot younger than I. I sure missed some things. I learned later that younger brothers and sisters go, oh, every time the oldest does something, it's a big deal. By the time we do it, it's old hat. We have to go to everything big brother does. He doesn't have to go to everything we do. Uh, and I just miss the opportunity of being a big brother because most of my life with my family was spent thinking unfair. Now, there's an interesting thing about this unfair and keeping score and comparison you know we only do it one way we only compare to those that we think have a better deal than we do we usually don't look and think about those that we would say no I got a better deal going than them we only focus on here I remember being so shocked <clears throat> a friend of mine we were good friends in junior high and we were friends in high school, but just didn't hang out as much. And when we were 20, we were talking one time, and he said, you know, I want to confess, I was always envious of you in high school. And I was like, me? Why? Because I thought, you were athletic. Everything you did, you were good at it. I was always Mr. Average. This guy was class president. So a couple of times, he was class favorite. People liked him, and I was thinking, why would you be envious of me? And one of the things he reminded me was how much he loved my dad and respected him. And it was because when we played ball games, my dad would always come up to him and say, good game. Or he'd put his arm around him and said, you guys played hard. And I started thinking about that, and I thought, you know, that's right. We're just a couple of lockers down from each other. And it was common for dads to come in after the football game and speak to a lot of the guys. And I did notice that my dad spent more time with Bobby than he did 
with like some of the other guys. And it dawned on me as we were talking, Bobby's parents never went. To, he, they hardly ever went to his events. He, he, you know, his parents wasn't involved in that. I never thought about that issue because I was too focused on how things were not fair on this side. And then he reminded me that he was 20 and never had a car. I'm like, no, he didn't. He was always getting rides. Interesting how that comparison is one-sided. Well, thank goodness that just as childhood and teenage years, right, never m moves on into adulthood. So I wonder how many have been in this situation. You get married, you have to move into an apartment. Maybe even one of you is still going to school, so you just have one salary. When you're young, they're all starting salaries. Money's tight. After a year or two or three or four years, whatever, how long you were in that apartment, oh, you couldn't stand living in that apartment. Uh, the neighbors were noisy. It just didn't feel private. You did, you'd love to have a yard, all these things. And you finally get that first house, and you love that house. It may only be two-bedroom and doesn't have that much of a yard, but you love that house, and there was so much freedom and you felt so blessed to have a house rather than an apartment. And then comes the day that there's some friends who invite you over so that you can see their new house. And their new house has four bedrooms and a large living room, and it's got granite top kitchen. And you spend and have a fun evening, and you go back to your house, and it just doesn't look the same, does it? It's like all of a sudden... This house that brought us so, joy, so much joy now kind of feels like a little dump. Now, we compare some things materialistically. I think we often look and go, what kind of deal did I get in this life? But sometimes we go to things that are really deep and personal that's more than just materialistic. So Dina and I have known couples who've struggled to get pregnant and after a couple of years they were just heartbreaking and almost every one of them have this same scenario one day they're somewhere and they're in line at somewhere like target and there's a mom with a couple of little kids and the kids don't look like they've been taken care of well and mom's screaming at them and may even use profanity and all of a sudden you go so i I would take a child and I would raise him to love the Lord. I'm not a screamer. I don't use profanity. Why do they get children and we're struggling so hard to have children? So parents have a child and there's some kind of disability. And as that child grows, they look at other children and they go, my child will never be able to do those things. And when you compare those things, it's hard not to be bitter and resentful. I know there's probably some families here that Thanksgiving and Christmas are not much of a time of joy for you because you hear of those families that love to get together and they love each other and they all get together and have a great time. But for you... Your mom and dad split up early in life, and you might have a stepbrother or stepsister, but y'all really don't even like each other, and there's no family. And when it comes to family gathering events like Thanksgiving and Christmas, instead of it being a joyous time, you feel pretty empty and alone. Life is not fair if we want to look around and see what people might have that we don't have. So Jesus made an interesting statement here. He said, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. We could talk a lot about what that means. He used that in Mark 9 when they said, who's the greatest in the kingdom and Jesus says, he who serves is the greatest of all. And he who is first will be last. And last will be first. And at that time, Jesus is saying, 
you don't understand greatness. In this case, it was greatness equals servanthood. And sometimes we equal living a good life as we should be rewarded more than others that we think don't live quite as good a life. You know, even preachers and ministers struggle with comparison. We work at a church. We want our church to flourish. We want to see numbers grow. And you work and you do that. And then somebody else starts something and it just grows. And you, it almost feels like, what, am I not spiritual enough? <laughs> am I, do I have some hidden sins that need to be? What is it that we struggle here and they don't seem to struggle? The idea of comparison, the idea that things ought to be distributed evenly, evidently doesn't hit God's radar. Evidently, God says, I will be generous to whom I will be generous to. Have I done you wrong? Man, that's a tough question to answer. Have I done you wrong? If I'm generous to somebody else, Does that mean I've wronged you? What that says is that our mindset is that our faith might be more in things and what we accomplish in our status than it is in God. The good news of the gospel is not what stuff or how easy our life is. The good news of the gospel is that we get God. Jesus came. He died on the cross for our sins so that there may be nothing between us and God. We have full access to him. We have full access to the Holy Spirit. And so when Peter is talking about reward... Jesus says, yeah, you're going to get a hundred times reward, and you'll get eternal life. And Jesus is saying, you get to be with us, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That is enough. That is more than enough. And it's more than anything else that we could compare ourselves and think we may be in on the short end of the stick. I want to finish with Psalm 23 today, if you'll turn over there with me. A very familiar psalm, and there's so much depth to it. I think that's why it's, it's the most familiar psalm and one of the most familiar passages in the Bible. Psalm 23, listen to this faith statement of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I am shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. You are with me. You're enough. You are with me. No matter what valley I'm walking through, you are with me, and that's enough. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Today, we want to offer something to you. We want to offer that we'll pray for you. If you struggle with the idea of comparison, of keeping score, if you struggle about trusting God fully when it doesn't look like maybe things have been distributed evenly, we want to pray for you. Today, if you've never put on Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never stepped into that relationship, we want to say God is more than enough. Whatever your situation is, he is more than enough. We're going to stand here in just a moment.
If you, there's some way we can help you, you can come forward down here. We have elders who will meet with you. We'll have an elder out just outside the auditorium over to your right. He'd be glad to pray with you. If there's anything that we can do for you today, we ask that you come while we stand and sing.